Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to August Planning Launches at Noon webinar uh, plan as part of uh, OPD's plan webinar series. Um, today's webinar is Overview of 2023 Municipal Land Use Regulation Survey Results. I'm Noah Hodgetts, a Principal Planner in the Office of Planning and Development at the New Hampshire Department of Business and Economic Affairs. Here's a quick reminder on how to use the Microsoft Teams webinar controls. Um, please put your questions in the chat and I'll do the best to answer them um, either um, during the presentation if there's a, a relevant question about a slide I'm on or we should also have time at the end of today's webinar um, for additional questions. Here's a brief overview of what we're going to cover today. I'm first going to go over briefly uh, the municipal, municipal land use regulation process. Um, then we'll talk about the topics covered on the municipal land use regulation survey. Uh, I'll go through a bit of the data from our 2023 survey results. Uh, we'll then talk about uh, different um, products and tools. Um, in which uh, you can interact with the data and download the data. Uh, I'll then do a quick uh, tutorial of how to use the interactive map. Uh, and finally, uh, we'll talk about some examples of housing related zoning changes um, that we identified um, in the 20 from the 2023 20, survey results as some pre preliminary findings from our initial review of some of the 2024 um, zoning amendments that got passed this past spring. So this is going to be a refresher for most folks, but in order for a community to enact any kind of local land use regulations, it first needs to create a planning board, the duties of which are detailed in RSA 674 colon 1. Uh, as I'll talk about a little later in the presentation, uh, all but two municipalities in New Hampshire have a planning board. The planning board then adopts bylaws and a map. Um, including the ability, authority to adopt and implement subdivision regulations. Um, the community legislative body can also authorize the planning board to prepare and adopt an, an, a zoning ordinance and then site plan uh, review regulations. Um, the planning board is also responsible for adopting, amending, and holding public hearings for excavation, driveway, and floodplain regulations, as well as for historic district regulations, local building code amendments, and adopting a capital improvement program if the local legislative body authorizes it to do so. Uh, so this and other topics are all covered on the Municipal Land Use Regulations Survey. So RSA 675 colon 9 establishes the Office of Planning and Development at, at the Department of Business and Economic Affairs at BEA as the state repository for all local land use regulations and documents, including master plans, zoning ordinances, historic district ordinances, capital improvement plans, building codes, subdivision regulations, and site plan review regulations. We also collect, while not um, detailed in the statute. We also collect driveway regulations, excavation regulations, uh, and wireless telecommunications ordinances. As well. uh, RSA 675 colon 9 also, also authorizes our office to conduct an annual survey of municipalities in order to collect information pertaining to new and or amended land use regulations and ordinances, which is what uh, that's the survey that we're reporting on the results of today, as well as putting together lists and reports of this information for use by municipalities and the general public by all of you on today's webinar. So just a kind of a refresher of what is covered on the survey. So a copy of the uh, 2023 Municipal Land Use Regulation Survey is shown on the left side of your screen. The 2023 survey covered um, many different topics, everything from municipal planning organizational structure to land use regulations and documents to master plan topics, uh, questions about housing related ordinances, uh, whether a municipality uh, enforces the building code at the local level and or has has its own uh, 
building code, which might be more restrictive than the state building code, uh, whether uh, the type of tools um, that a municipality has enacted for economic development, such as a range of other planning and development techniques, um, a few questions about water and shoreland regulations, and then a few questions about uh, regulation of um, alternative energy uh, systems. So in 2023, um, we did add a couple of new questions to the survey, which are highlight the uh, items that are highlighted yellow um, on the left side of your screen. Uh, those include a question about land use, uh, whether the land use fee schedule is posted and where the location it's posted in accordance with RSA 673 colon 16 Roman numeral three, which took effect in August 2022, as well as a couple of questions about whether a community has adopted an agricultural preservation ordinance or a recreation ordinance. Uh, and those, uh, those two questions actually came out of um, this guide called the Resilient Land Use Guide for New Hampshire, which was a collaboration of uh, Stafford Regional Planning Commission, Rockingham Planning Commission, and the Coastal Program at the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. There's a link to that guide at the end of this um, presentation. I am already seeing um, a uh, chat question. Um, so this is from Blair asking if a town adopts building codes, are those part of the zoning ordinance or treated as a Definitely not part of the zoning ordinance. Those would be a separate document. There are some communities that have um, published basically like a unified land use regulations or unified development regulations. Um, I have seen instances where uh, they might put the building codes in there, um, but they are definitely not part of the zoning ordinance. Um, what about scenic roads? So if a community does have some kind of ordinance regulating scenic roads, um, again, um, there's probably more something that would go in a kind of general land use regulations kind of compendium document than necessarily the zoning ordinance itself. Um, unless the regulation of scenic roads um, is somehow integrated into the uh, way it regulates zoning uh, and ties back to, uh, you know, scenic roads in specific districts, uh, so on and so forth. So hopefully that's helpful, Blair. Um, okay. So the 2023 survey was completed for all 234 municipalities, as well as nine village districts with zoning authority uh, in Coas County, which has zoning authority over 23 unincorporated places in the North Country. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, we added Pease Development Authority, which has zoning authority over the Pease uh, Trade Port uh, in Newington and Portsmouth, the old uh, Pease, which is where the old Pease Air Force Base is. Um, and this year we made a change in how we uh, collected the information. Um, so this year, um, OPD staff uh, updated or the survey and filled out the survey based on publicly available information on municipal websites, review of zoning, zoning ballots and reports, um, and other uh, updated zoning ordinances and other uh, land use regulations that communities uh, may have submitted to us in accordance with RSA 675-9. We then sent the survey to each jurisdiction uh, covered on the survey. Uh, there's 245 if you add up all those different categories here and provide an opportunity for each jurisdiction to note any changes or additions um, to the content we collected on the survey. Um, we've just found that overall sometimes um, just relying on um, information that uh, municipalities provide, um, you know, especially for smaller communities, um, you know, we, we end up finding that we find, um, we go to confirm that information and may find a different, slightly different interpretation of what they may have reported on the survey. Um, and so we have, this is now the second year we've kind of decided to switch how we've collecting data on the survey to increase the, um, 
accuracy of the survey data and results that we're reporting. Um, a couple other notes um, is that there are two unincorporated places, Livermore in Grafton County and Hales location in Carroll County, um, which are not uh, included as part of the survey because there's no entity that has any local land use regulation or zoning authority over them. So, and generally uh, we found um, that 144 out of 226 jurisdictions that have zoning authority, so that's 64% of jurisdictions in 2023, excuse me, adopted at least one zoning amendment. Um, and the vast majority of these were adopted by ballot um, at town meeting. So now digging a little bit deeper, results. Aside from definition changes and other housekeeping, zoning amendments passed to ensure passed to ensure uh, municipal zoning ordinances are consistent with recent state statute changes. As I said, um, of the 144 communities that enacted uh, zoning changes um, by adoption of zoning amendments in 2023, zoning amendments ranged from everything from updates to their cluster development, open space subdivision ordinances, to changes to their sign ordinances, um, to everything in between. Um, and we'll talk about it in more detail later in the presentation. Um, a disproportionate number of these zoning amendments did affect uh, the regulation of new housing construction. Uh, and while it's well beyond the scope of this survey to try to assign motive to specific zoning amendments, um, at least we, we've picked up on a couple of factors that we think are probably driving uh, the increase in housing related zoning amendments. One, municipalities um, responding to the state's growing housing shortage. Uh, two, um, trying to respond to recent state statute changes, um, which might re uh, require um, certain, uh, or sorry, sorry, I should say, have placed uh, certain restrictions on um, how communities regulate housing, um, as well as finally pending legislation affecting the regulation of new housing development um, that municipalities are trying to get ahead of uh, knowing that there could be legislation uh, coming down the pike. Um, so, found um, there are where four communities um, amended their ADU ordinances in 2023 to allow detached ADUs. Six communities, six new communities adopted workforce housing ordinances for the first time. Um, eight communities adopted short-term rental regulations and 10 new communities adopted uh, definitions or regulations for uh, solar arrays in 2023. And finally, one additional community adopted RSA 79E, which provides tax relief to encourage investment and rehabilitation of underutilized buildings in downtowns and town centers. Uh, we'll go through uh, each one of these items now in a little bit closer detail. And so, Actually, before we get to that, um, just a couple of other findings um, from the survey. So um, while 19 communities located primarily in Grafton and Coas County have not adopted an or a zoning ordinance under RSA 674 colon 16, as I noted at the outset of, the, of today's webinar, there are um, only two communities um, in very northern Coas County, Pittsburgh and Clarksville that do not have a planning board established under RSA 673 colon one. So you might be wondering, okay, there's 19 communities that don't have, have an adopted zoning, but 17 of those communities have a planning board. So why, why are you having a, why have they decided to um, create a planning board if they're not gonna adopt zoning? Well, many of those communities that uh, lack zoning um, have adopted several other types of land use regulations, including residential subdivision regulations, wireless telecommunications ordinances, a drinking water ordinance, or in many cases are members of the National Flood Insurance Program um, and are required to have floodplain development ordinances um, administered by their planning board. So, and 
I will say on, on that kind of related note um, of those 19 um, non-zoning communities, um, 12 of them um, so uh, have a uh, zoning board of adjustment established under RSA 674 colon one uh, to administer appeals of uh, those land use regulations, those non-zoning land use regulations that the planning board um, may be administering. Um, and many, many times that's uh, the floodplain ordinance. So a couple other, like I said, uh, general findings here. Um, 57 communities have adopted historic district ordinances, but those are all uh, happen to be in the southern half of the state. 198 communities representing 80% of communities in the state have adopted a wireless telecommunications ordinance um, with the only communities that haven't done so clustered at the northern tip of the state or on the western edge in, our, in the lower population density uh, areas that typically are forested that have likely never up never had to contend with the sighting of a cellular communications tower in their community and just haven't had a reason to adopt a wireless telecommunications ordinance. Um, we also found uh, that municipal planning capacity also really varies greatly throughout the state with the highest concentration of full-time planners located in the southern and eastern sections of the state. Um, and this is important because, not surprisingly, as we'll talk about a little bit later, there's a clear correlation between communities that have more uh, planning capacity, whether it's um, full-time planning staff or planning consultants, and the number and kind of complexity of innovative land use controls and other planning tools that they've adopted and are using. Um, and so I'll just point out with these numbers on the right side of your slide here that a uh, full 30% of communities, 72 communities, have no planning staff or planning consultant whatsoever. Um, that they're, uh, so basically in these communities, it's just the volunteer planning board um, with maybe an administrative assistant um, shepherding all the applications um, through the process. Um, so, and in the communities that do have more planning capacity, um, I'll note as again, as I'll talk about a little bit later, Portsmouth, Dover, and Londonderry um, have adopted and utilized the most innovative land use controls uh, and other planning tools authorized under the innovative land use control statute 674-21. I'll also note for our um, folks um, that are, might be active um, or part of their regional planning commission, um, that regional planning commission staff also provide circuit rider circuit rider planning assistance to 36 communities. So now going back to some of those earlier findings um, that I talked about. Um, so 68 uh, communities have adopted at least, have updated at least one section of their master plan since 2020 including 23 that updated at least one section of their master plan in 2023, with an increasing number of communities adopting master plan sections, deviating from the 17 master plan topics or sections enumerated in RSA 674 colon, colon two. Um, and some of these kind of sections or emerging, emerging master plan topics include broadband, community health, climate change, arts, and resiliency. And while the survey, our survey doesn't track which master plan sections the community updates each, each year, it's just, it's, we just don't have room on the survey um, to, tra to track that. Um, we do kind of have noted in kind of reviewing master plan um, updates that um, we are seeing you know, in part due to limited resource and capacity, municipalities uh, increasingly just, you know, updating one or two master plan chapters per year on its own, rather than doing a comprehensive master plan update. Um, this is certainly not a best practice um, by any means, but it is a way um, that communities have kind of, you know, Gone, we have seen kind of communities updating their master plans. Um, as a reminder, the statute does recommend updating the master plan every five to 10 years, um, but there's certainly no kind of binding requirement that the municipality does this. Um, and so just to illustrate this point further, the map on the left shows a decade in which a community last updated at least one section of its master plan. Um, communities in purple, um, the, 
have some of them have master plans that have not been updated since prior to 1980. Um, so, you know, for those communities updating, you know, probably the entire master plan is, you know, um, not relevant um, to, to conditions on the ground today. Um, and, you know, updating one or two chapters is maybe a place to start. Um, but that said, um, you know, we really do try to encourage um, where possible uh, trying to do a complete master plan update just because even though statute lists out these separate sections, um, you know, from a planning perspective, it's really hard to separate out, um, you know, all the different areas from transportation, from housing, um, from uh, conservation land, from um, utilities, uh, so on and so forth. So, and we'll talk a little bit later about some available resources for updating specific sections of the master plan. So now turning back to um, some of the housing related findings that I uh, uh, referenced at the outset, um, among 80, among New Hampshire's 234 municipalities, 82 communities have a workforce housing ordinance. This is an increase of six from the 2022 survey, representing 35% of communities in the state, um, including 33 communities that have a workforce housing multifamily overlay district. Um, and these are these ordinances and overlay districts are uh, in accordance with um, the requirements of the state's workforce housing law, RSA 674 colon 58 to 61. And, um, you know, while historically the majority of communities adopting workforce housing ordinances have been in uh, southern New Hampshire, the Seacoast, the Mount Washington Valley, and the Upper Valley, where housing cross cost pressures have been the greatest. Um, in recent years where we've seen kind of this, um, you know, in the last four years, um, significant appreciation in home prices um, and, or I should say, decrease in housing um, availability um, and really almost every town throughout the state. We're also starting to see more rural communities um, facing a growing workforce and housing shortage, also considering adoption of workforce housing ordinances, um, which is an interesting trend. And we'll have to see if that continues in the years ahead. Um, and kind of a caveat on this one on workforce housing ordinances. So, you know, some communities just simply say we're going to create um, a workforce housing, a ordinance that allows workforce housing ordinance, uh, workforce housing uh, that meets the definition of um, for workforce housing. It's different for rental uh, and for ownership um, as as defined in RSA 674 colon 8 to 58 to 61. And some communities have said, we're going to go a step further than that and have created a or added a inclusionary zoning clause or section to their workforce housing ordinance, which basically um, in short provides a density bonus or some other type of incentive in exchange for a property owner voluntarily, voluntarily agreeing to rent or sell a percentage of their units um below market rate um and the other thing we found is so there was these um six new communities that adopted workforce housing ordinances there were also five communities in 2023 that had workforce housing ordinances or workforce housing multifamily overlay districts on the books prior to 2023 that amended their districts or ordinances in 2023 to actually try to increase opportunities for workforce housing and i'll talk a little bit about age-restricted housing uh it's really 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 interesting um findings from this year's survey. So 78 communities have age-restricted housing rep regulations, um, representing 33% of communities in the state. Uh, this number is actually unchanged in the survey, but there's been kind of a lot of changes. Um, so the total number of communities with age-restricted regulations is unchanged, there's been a lot of changes um, as a result of a statute change, um, which took effect July 1st, 2023, uh, which requires incentives for age-restricted housing to also be applicable to workforce housing. So as a result of the statute change, um, requiring age-restricted 
housing incentives to now also apply to developments intended to be workforce housing. Um, municipalities have um, taken various actions uh, ranging from um, expanding their age-restricted housing ordinances um, and their applicability, reducing their applicability or repealing their age-restricted regulations outright, um, making their um, workforce housing ordinances more restrictive, um, or amending um, their age-restricted ordinances uh, requirements and incentives to their age-restricted ordinances to align more with the requirements and incentives in their workforce housing ordinances without creating additional restrictions. So, you know, we're not 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 placing a value judgment here on you know whether there's a um, you know what one one is better than the other, but it is really interesting to see kind of how one how uh, different communities have taken. Um, kind of different path um, in response to responding to the statute change. And I am seeing some questions. I will get back to them. We're going to keep moving forward for the time being. Oh, sorry, skipped ahead there. So now I was going to, uh, just looking in on uh, ADU, accessory dwelling unit ordinances for a minute. So since RSA 674 colon 70, 71 through 73 went into effect on June 1st, 2017, uh, 206 jurisdictions representing 88% um, percent of um, in the state have adopted uh, an ADU ordinance um, in their zoning ordinance. Um, and I don't, I thought I copied over, I believe this was an increase of four or five um, from uh, 2022. I'm sorry, I'm just looking on my other screen. Um, I do not, sorry, I do not have that number, but there was a, a couple of additional communities that adopted ADU ordinances in 2023. Um, and as everybody probably knows, but just a refresher, the statute uh, requires communities that have adopted a zoning ordinance to allow attached ADUs and single family residential zoning districts as of right by special exception or conditional use permit. Um, so again, uh, how communities have chosen to comply with this requirement really varies. Um, so, um, that said, of the 206 jurisdictions with an ADU ordinance, about half the jurisdictions that regulate ADUs or uh, permit, uh, permit them as of right, while the other half require either a conditional use permit or special exception. And of the 206 communities that um, have an ADU ordinance, um, a little over or just roughly, Half of them um, also allow uh, detached ADUs. 113 communities representing 48% of communities in the state um, allow detached ADUs. But generally speaking, uh, communities that allow both attached and detached ADUs, they may allow the attached ADU as of right, but they typically do require the detached uh, a, do subject the detached ADU to a discretionary approval process, either via conditional use permit from the planning board or a special exception from the zoning board. And um, the communities the, on this map in gray um, are ones that don't have an ADU ordinance at all. So the statute for those communities, statute requires communities, um, or basically, I'm sorry, statute, um, basically says that one accessory dwelling unit is permitted as of right to any single family dwelling in a municipality that does not have an ADU ordinance. Um, all that said, uh, the map on the right um, you're showing, you're seeing, which is from our interactive map, which we'll uh, look through in closer detail in a minute, um, is showing you um, the communities that uh, allow detached ADUs are shown in green, and the communities that do not allow detached ADUs are shown in red. So I'll talk a little bit about short-term rental regulations. Um, so, um, you know, I think we've all seen a significant increase in short-term rentals, both in the state's tourism regions, including the Mount Washington Valley, the Lakes region, and the Seacoast, um, as well as in other parts of the state. And as a result, um, according to our survey, eight, eight additional communities added definitions 
uh, for short-term rentals or adopted short-term rental regulations in 2023, increasing the number of communities that regulate short-term rentals to 49. Um, we also, as I said, um, kind of saw a trend uh, for the first time beginning in 2023, so I guess you can't really call it a trend yet, um, is that um, as a result of kind of short-term rentals bubbling up in other maybe non-traditional tourist communities, um, communities in Southern New Hampshire, um, communities like Epsom and Jaffrey and Newmarket um, and other communities um, have also adopted uh, short-term rental regulations as well. Um, Conway also enacted a short, short and long-term rental licensing inspection program. Um, this was actually done by their um, board of selectmen, and Easton uh, enacted a short-term rental permitting requirement. Um, these communities already had some language in their zoning ordinance already, so these are more just kind of changes to their existing requirements. Um, and the map you're seeing on the left part of your screen um, the communities that have adopted short-term rental regulations are shown in light pink. Communities that have enacted tiny us ordinances, um, which required drawing units only meet the minimum square footage requirements required by the state building code, are shown in purple. And communities that have adopted both short-term rental and tiny us regulations are shown in blue. Um, there was a reason we grouped these two topics together a few years ago. I can't remember. We'll probably kind of separate uh, create kind of an own category for short-term rental regulations uh, in next year's survey, just given the uh, significant increase in communities regulating short-term regulations, short-term rentals uh, over the last four years. So now a little bit about solar ordinances. So we've also seen a steady increase in a number of communities adopting um, solar ordinances regulating roof and or ground mounted solar arrays. Uh, in 2023, 10 communities adopted definitions for solar arrays or, so, or a solar ordinance, bringing the number of communities with solar energy regulations to 73. Um, those communities with solar uh, ordinances, um, I'm sorry, those communities that regulate both uh, ground mounted and rooftop uh, solar ordin uh, solar arrays are shown uh, in green in the map uh, on the middle part of your screen. Uh, those that only regulate uh, ground mounted solar arrays are shown in that lighter yellow. And I think there's one or two communities hidden or in the map uh, shown in brown that only regulate rooftop solar arrays. Um, and um, Oh no, it's 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 interesting. What we found is some communities regulate solar arrays actually have a section in their zoning ordinance regulating solar arrays, kind of creating um, regulations around the use around that as a use in their zoning ordinance. Um, while some communities have decided to really put the um, their regulations around solar ordinances into their site plan review regulations in a very little detail about solar arrays in their zoning ordinance. Uh, two different approaches. Uh, not sure there's really a right or a wrong. Again, just different municipalities have chosen to do it in different ways. Um, one other finding related to solar ordinances is that, um, you know, we've definitely seen that the um, communities have, as solar arrays have gotten lar larger, uh, larger, or larger solar arrays have been cited throughout the state, communities have um, tried to enact increasingly complex uh, solar ordinances, uh, trying to get at, trying to get at and address everything from um, buffering to lot coverage to decommissioning. So now I want to talk a little bit about um, housing related changes. I'm sorry. Um, housing related zoning changes. And before I get to that, I just very briefly want to talk about uh, some of the data. Um, that we uh, have related to planning and zoning tools for housing. So, um, and this is by all means not an exhaustive list of tools um, for uh, for housing, but um, at least really more covers the tools um, that we have data from uh, from our survey. So, through the lens of how communities can utilize innovative land use controls and other planning tools and techniques to increase opportunities for housing and, in, and incentivize infill development in already developed areas. Um, so, so we have this um, 
slide is showing data on the number of communities that have adopted certain tools and everything from mixed use zoning to workforce housing, multifamily overhead districts, inclusionary zoning, density bonuses, cluster developments, form-based codes, detached ADUs, plan unit developments, trans, uh, transfer development rights, and village plan alternative subdivisions. Not gonna go through kind of each of those tools, but the important thing to note is just that the number next to each of those planning tools refers to the number of communities which have adopted such a tool according to our survey results. Uh, so for example, 146 communities have adopted some form of mixed use zoning. Um, if you want additional information really about any of these tools, uh, the best resource is the New Hampshire Housing Toolbox, um, which there's a link to here, um, and will also be in the slides. Um, which are on our website, which also send out uh, to all attendees after today's webinar. Uh, the New Hampshire Housing Toolbox is a product of BEA and was also a collaboration of the RPCs and contains 20 planning and zoning strategies for communities interested um, in increasing their housing production. And as I think I noted earlier, uh, Dover, uh, Portsmouth, and Londonderry are the only communities that have adopted um, I'm sorry, Dover is the only community that's adopted all these tools, uh, followed by Portsmouth, which has adopted all but a village plan alternative subdivision, and Londonderry, which has adopted all but a form-based code and village plan alternative subdivision. So a couple of uh, conclusions before we talk about different ways to interact with the data. So again, uh, many 2023 um, zoning changes reported on the from our 2023 survey results pertain to where and how housing is regulated across the state. Uh, some communities did roll back housing incentives or or decided to tighten um, their kind of housing related regulations. Um, but overall, uh, many communities are utilizing innovative planning and zoning approaches to increase opportunities in their communities while planning proactively for the future. Uh, that said, there are some kind of a couple of remaining challenges that I think it's important for everybody to be aware of. Um, just making sure, as I think, you know, this webinar is an example, can be one of many examples of making sure communities are aware that there's all these different innovative uh, planning tools uh, out there. Um, authorized by the Innovative Land Use Control Statute 674.21 and beyond. Um, making sure, as we've said, as I've kind of said and noted the difference of that communities have the necessary resources and capacity to adopt and administer these different tools. Um, making um, development community um, and potential applicants uh, aware that a community has adopted uh, some tools. I, you know, cannot tell you um, you know how many times I've you know re reviewed a community zoning ordinance and said well this community on paper has a this, uh, uh, cluster zoning or conservation subdivision is a great example but um, you know for whatever reason it's never uh, that section of the ordinance has never been taken advantage of or utilized by an applicant uh, sometimes that can be due to a certain uh, shortcomings of the ordinance, but other times it may simply be that a uh, development community just doesn't know that that tool may be available to them uh, in that particular community. Uh, and finally, as kind of a um, tag along to that previous previous point, just encouraging uh, development community and applicants to kind of think outside the box and utilize these, these kind of innovative tools um, in the communities that have adopted them. So now, um, kind of a quick um, overview of how, all the different ways you can interact with the survey results. So uh, there's a story map which summarizes the results, um, which will be coming soon on our website. There's an interactive map, which I'm going to uh, do a brief uh, tutorial of in a couple minutes. Uh, there's a community by community snapshot. Uh, there's a uh, list of zoning amendments adopted in 2023, and there's also topic specific tables. All these different um, tools and data products um, are available right now on the Municipal Land Use Regulation Survey webpage, um, which is hyperlinked on this slide. And again, as I said, we'll be sending out a copy of the slides um, after today's webinar. 
Um, I'm also will have my colleague Alvina uh, on the call put a link to the municipal lands regulation survey webpage in the chat if it's not if she hasn't done so already. Um, and as I said, the story map is the one um, item that's not available yet on that web page. We'll, we'll notify all the re um, registrants and attendees of today's webinar when the story map is available for viewing. So I already talked about this, the story map, which just goes into a little bit more detail um, on all the topics we talked about today, as well as other topics, including uh, 79E, mixed use zoning, and uh, open space residential cluster developments, as well as impact fees and growth management ordinances. Um, as I said, here's what the um, interactive map uh, looks like uh, when you open it. Um, we're not, I'm not going to go through this in detail on this slide because we're going to do a tutorial in a minute. Here is what the community by community snapshot looks like, which is basically the complete survey results for each community sorted by topic as organized by the survey and includes everything from links to each community's land use regulations, master plans, and zoning ordinances to the different planning tools um, that Dave adopted. Um, it's, it's a massive one single PDF document, but you can simply do a control F when you open the document and search for the community that you're looking for. Um, that's really the best way to search and utilize um, the community by community snapshot PDF. And then finally is uh, new for 2023. Um, is a table summarizing zoning amendments um, adopted in each jurisdiction that has zoning authority. Um, so this is, and I will say with the caveat, this is not a, this is not meant to be a word for word uh, resuscitation of um, zoning of every zoning amendment that each community adopted, but rather a higher level summary. So um, we did our best to kind of characterize. Um, each zoning amendment, um, but it's not a, it's not a substitute for actually reading each community zoning ordinance and reading the actual um, wording of zoning amendments on zoning balance. And I think I already did talk about the, also the ability to download um, tables um, for each topic covered on the survey. Uh, this year, instead of listing out uh, each table on the website, we've provided again on the Municipal Land Use Regulation Survey webpage a uh, link to a Google Drive where you can download uh, each of these uh, a table for each of these topics. On the right, you're seeing a uh, how the tables are organized by topic on the Google Drive. So before we get to the tutorial. Um, just a couple of uh, housing related zoning changes adopted in 2023, which we identified uh, from our survey results. So just looking at a couple of single family uh, zoning changes uh, in 2023, Keene reduced minimum lot sizes from five to two acres in its low density rural district. Uh, and Lebanon um, adopted a cottage style um, or uh, development ordinance, which allows clusters of up to 16, 1500 square foot cottages in all residential districts by conditional use permit on lots as small as 20,000 square foot that are on water and sewer. And on lots as fall, small as 40,000 square feet that are on well or septic. Uh, and the maps um, shown on the slides and the following slides um, are actually from the New Hampshire Housing Zoning Atlas, showing just as an example of within each of these communities where those changes apply. Um, Ossipi, uh now as a result of uh, amending their zoning ordinance in 2023 to permit duplexes by right in its commercial and roadside commercial districts, um, now allows duplexes or two family dwellings um, in all seven of its zoning districts if you've met all of their lot size and dimensional requirements. Uh, New London amended its workforce housing overlay district in 2023 to provide um, density bonuses and allow a range of housing types, including garden style multifamily workforce housing, and multifamily workforce housing townhomes in all zoning districts by conditional use permit. It also gave additional flexibility to the planning board to waive certain dimensional requirements for workforce housing. 
Uh, and then a couple of uh, a, uh, noteworthy ADU uh, changes to note. ADU expanded their ADU ordinance in 2023 to allow two ADUs on all lots where single family homes are allowed with one of the two ADUs allowed to be detached. Um, and Manchester amended their zoning ordinance to increase the allowed, the maximum kind of allowed size of ADUs and expanded locations in the districts in which they were allowed, um, as well as um, reducing or lowering the number of parking spaces per ADU to only require one parking space per ADU. Uh, and then finally, um, for manufactured housing uh, in 2023, Berlin amended their zoning ordinance to allow manufactured housing on any lot that allows single family dwellings, including in the rural residential district shown in the map on the top right. In Lebanon, reduce the minimum lot size to 5,000 square foot lots um, in manufactured housing parks um, and reduce the buffer, including required um, paved road width um, for uh, manufactured housing parks. So a lot, a lot, of, lot of really interesting changes. Uh, there's a there's just a very very small sample of kind of the changes you could these these and many other changes you would see uh, captured in that uh, list of zoning amendment changes that I noted earlier. Um, and we've just started our review of zoning amendments adopted to date in 2024, including zone amendments um, adopted by ballot at town meeting this past spring as part of kind of as part of getting going on the 2024 Municipal Land Use Regulation Survey. And while we definitely haven't reviewed every zoning ballot yet, um, in line again with kind of similar trends we saw in 2023, again, a lot, we've seen a high number of communities making housing related zoning changes. Um, and generally these changes fall uh, into some of the, into kind of following kind of six buckets. Changes around ADUs, around mixed use zoning, around increasing density for areas on water and sewer, around reduction in minimum lot sizes, especially in rural districts, as well as um, for areas on water and sewer. And then finally, um, streamlining the process for alternative housing types and then creating additional incentives and allowances for tiny houses, cluster housing, cottage courts. Um, we'll also note again, as I kind of, as I think I noted earlier, uh, is that there were definitely also communities that uh, where housing related zoning changes were either defeated. And actually a few communities that we found that um, they actually increased their minimum lot sizes. So again, um, every municipality um, has kind of chosen to take in uh, its own avenue. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see what else. Stay tuned uh, next year for around this time next year when we're reporting on our complete 2024 Municipal Land Use Regulation Survey results. So, with that, um, I'm going to do quickly a, uh, let's see if this will work. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing um, the slide for a minute um, and bring up um, our interactive map, um, which um, Alvina uh, has just shared a note to. Um, and hopefully that was relatively seamless um, for folks. So this is the Municipal Land Use Regulation Survey interactive map. Um, forgive me, it's on my other screen, which is why I'm now looking away from the camera. Um, so every topic um, on the survey um, is, um, organized here is listed here as part of this map. So for example, um, you can hit this drop down on land use regulations and documents. Um, and if we wanted to say turn on that layer to see when a community last updated one chapter, at least one chapter of its master plan, we'd hit the little I button here for mass on master plan layer 2023. Uh, and then you can zoom in. Um, and you will now see um, every community. And we'll just click on, I'll, say I'll just click on, and I don't know what's going to come up, community of Loudon, for example. So you can click on a community. Uh, it may, if it doesn't open as the first box, um, there may be another layer that populates first. You may have to hit this little kind of next button at the bottom here. 
Um, but once you've confident you found kind of the the uh, information for the layer that you're looking at uh, for the land use regulations and documents uh, for the last row that says bottom row here that says URL. Um, these are actually live hyperlinks. So assuming the link is still um, active, uh, you can hit the link and it will take you uh, right to that community's land use regulation or page. In this case, this is the page for Loudon's master plan um, where it lists all the different chapters it's updated. Um, they also here listed the date that the master plan was last amended, the decade it was amended, when it was originally adopted, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so. We'll do, I'm going to do this for a couple of these, just so folks kind of get a general idea. Um, we haven't done it, but um, you know, I think what we we'll probably will do, because uh, it's not entirely intuitive, is put a little bit of a kind of add a recording to our website of how to use the interactive map um, for folks that are um, kind of want to have a recording, a little bit more detailed recording of how to turn on and off layers, and um, identify information and how to use the interactive map. So we'll say, I'll look at another layer. This is a really interesting one. Uh, so this is one of these new categories that we added um, in 2023. This is this land use fees layer posted. So um, this was a uh, layer uh, that says all the communities that it say they posted their land use regulations are shown in green. Uh, and I believe all the ones in red are not posted. I believe all the ones that, yes, so let me see how this is listed. Uh, so any community that has fees with the green posted uh, should take you right to its fee schedule. So there you go. So now, um, again, uh, if you want to look up the land use fee schedule for any community, um, at least as of 2023. It's the caveat that some of these links that are kind of we've hyperlinked to in this interactive map may have since changed. Um, you can turn this layer on and click on a community and find that information. Uh, a few more uh, layers before we get to the conclusion of the presentation. Um, so is, I'm going to go back to that short term rental topic now. Um, and just look at that for a minute. Um, so that is in under um, housing information, under short-term rental tiny houses. Um, see if it populates. And hopefully the map is populating in real time for folks. So again, you can see, as I've said earlier, um, this kind of increase. And this is zoomed in, so it's so close. So previously, whereas um, Short-term rentals were real regulations were really concentrated in the north half of the state. Uh, we're seeing more of this kind of preponderance and expansion of short-term rental regulations into more communities a lot uh, in southern New Hampshire, which is again an interesting trend. Um, so these, this layer, for example, you can certainly click a community to see if it has a short-term rental regulation. There's no additional information though provided about those short-term rental regulations. Uh, and that's the case for most of these layers. Um, the other function I was going to say for the map is you can uh, click on if you just want to see your community and may not know where uh, your community is on the larger map. You can just you can't you can't ju you have you can type in a specific address. So I'll put in the uh, my address here at BEA, so 100 North Main Street, Concord, New Hampshire, um, and it's going to say here. Okay, and uh, should zoom you right there. Can then zoom back out again if the, if it doesn't freeze up on me. Yep. And now I can see that I'm within the limits of Concord, and then kind of turn layers on and off that way to see what exactly. Uh, if I just want to view um, information or turn a layer on and look at within Concord, uh, see where things apply. So that is a uh, very very quick, quick and dirty. Uh, version of how to navigate the interactive map. Um, I encourage folks to uh, play around with the map. Um, and um, as always, um, if you have questions, um, feel free to, uh, or having trouble using the map, feel free to reach out uh, to myself or to my colleague Alvina um, about how to use the map. Um, 
but there's just a, it's a great great way to kind of um, understand and kind of visualize all that all the survey data which may is otherwise kind of hard to kind of um, digest in just narrative format or just rows and rows of data in an Excel table. So um, we do have a couple questions. Uh, I think there's just two or three more slides here at the very end. So as I said earlier about opportunities for master plan updates, funding opportunities and updates, um, other resources. So I think everybody's aware, but um, if your community is looking for funding to update the housing related sections of your master plan to conduct a housing needs assessment or audit of your land use regulations or to develop housing related zoning changes, be sure to check out the Invest in H Housing Opportunity Planning Grant Program, the HOP grant program funded by BEA and being administered by New Hampshire Housing. Uh, applications are due September 30th. Close to 60 communities benefited from the first round of HOP grant funding, and now there's, addition, there's this additional $2.9 million available in funding. Um, and I, I will say, not captured yet on the 2023 results, but we did see, uh, at least in our preliminary review of some of the zone changes we reviewed for 2024, that a lot of communities that received HOP grants in the first round, to a disproportionate number of communities that received HOP grants in the first round of funding um, that had um, housing-related zoning changes that they were taking to the ballot this spring were successful, um, in part due to some of the, due to the education and community engagement um, strategies and requirements um, is taught as part of the Housing Academy program, which is part of the HOP grant program. So again, encourage you all to check that out. You can go to nhhopgrants.org. There's a link uh, here as well as a QR code for more information. And then finally, here are links to many different resources. Um, I think I already talked about the link to the Municipal Land Use Regulation Survey page earlier. Um, there's a couple other uh, interesting links. I know I mentioned that New Hampshire Housing Toolbox. I referenced the Resilient Land Use Guide. There's also a link to the New Hampshire Zoning Atlas, um, which if you are looking for kind of sub-municipal zoning district level uh, information, it's really a, a finer granularity than we're able to provide in this on a municipal land use regulation survey, uh, the Zoning Atlas can be a great resource as well and their data is updated through currently through June 30th of 2023, uh, sorry, June 1st of 2023. Uh, here's my contact information. Um, and um, if we don't get to all the questions right now, um, or if you're looking for specific data, trying to pull out specific data on the survey. Uh, and with that, um, we do have a couple minutes for questions. I do have a little time if need be. We can, I'm happy to stay on a few minutes after one for questions as well. So There's one that we missed. Um, did any municipalities remove parking minimums entirely? Did any um, in 2020? Uh, that's a really, really, really great questions. Mark, I do not know the answer to that question off the top of my head. I know there were a couple communities that did that in 2024. I would have to go back based on our preliminary review. I'd have to go back and look at if there were any communities that did that in 2023. Remember just that this results we're reporting on today are really are only from calendar year 2023. There's one more. Do inclusionary regulations typically require the provision of housing at 80% AMI or below or lower to qualify for incentives? I'm, just, I'm not sure. Let me go back to this. Uh, find this question again. Can you read the do inclusionary really typically require prison of housing at 80% of AMI below to qualify for incentives? Um I see the question. So there is no requirement that the um I think what this question is getting at is do the um requirements to the um air median income thresholds um in inclusionary zoning have to line up with the uh, definition of workforce housing and different area median income thresholds in the workforce housing statute, that being 60% uh, of AMI for three person housing, uh, three person uh, households for units that are for rent and 100% of AMI um, for four person households um, for uh, units that are for sale under the workforce housing statute. No, there is no requirement that the inclusionary zoning provisions and AMI levels um, basically conform with those statutory AMI requirements in the workforce housing statute. Um, 
That said, uh, and so I have seen communities do it differently. Some communities have actually created inclusionary zoning incentives for uh, AMI levels above 100% of AMI um, to kind of target more um, middle income housing, whatever whatever different communities have, or attainable housing communities have defined it differently. Um, but there is no re statutory requirement there. I will say though on the inclusionary zoning front uh, is that um, there no municipality right now, the way the uh, innovative uh, land use control statute 67421 um, is uh, written, any community that wants to enact inclusionary zoning right now has to provide, ha can only do that voluntarily. Um, they cannot um, require or compel a developer uh, to build a set number or percentage of income restricted um, units. Uh, they can provide some kind of incentive and say in exchange for utilizing this incentive, you need to um, build um, a certain percentage or units of income um, income restricted housing, but you cannot actually just require a uh, property owner or applicant to do that. Uh, so you have a comment from Cecilia, recent Jersey's court rule in Missouri can't restrict housing ownership by age. Uh, interesting comment, thank you. Um, got the parking one, Alvina had a clarification on the land use fees comment, thank you. Who do we contact if a link for our town needs to be updated? That's great. So you can um, email, and Alvina may have already put this in the chat, planning, best place to email is just planning at livefree.nh.gov. Um, Alvina has some more text here. Okay, I'm not seeing any additional uh, questions. And I'll give it another minute or two. Um, yeah, no, and I just wanted to emphasize that we will send out what we found for 2024 to communities for verification. So that's a good time to get back to us. Let us know what's wrong, what we didn't find, what we overfound, um, however you want to do it. But that's a really good time to get back to us when right. you get that survey for ver verification. Right. But that, that, colleague Alvina, I will just simply add that um, 675, uh, RSA 675 colon 9 says, you know, once you've amended your land use regulations, be it your site plan review regs, your subdivision regs, or zoning, that you send those to us. So, yes, feel free to wait until, you know, send that after you get the email from us next spring, but also feel free to send them to us any time of year that you adopt them uh, so that we can update our records um, accordingly sooner rather than later. Um, Laura has a question. Is this a statute that says that Miss Valley can't require us, require this for workforce housing? Um, so I think Laura is talking about what I was saying about inclusionary zoning. So the um, wording about inclusionary zoning not being required is actually, it just says inclusionary zoning must be a voluntary incentive. It says voluntary, not mandatory. Um, which the courts have interpreted to mean you cannot require that. And that reference is in, I will get you the exact reference right now, is in um, N674.21, is in uh, um, 674.21, Roman numeral four, uh, and then lettered number A. Um, which just is a definition for inclusionary zoning, which I will put uh, the link to here in the chat. And I'm also going to put, uh, and this is just a good reference as well, uh, a link to the Innovative Land Use Control Statute. So there you go. And then um, and the last thing, I'm not seeing any more questions. But the last thing my colleague Alvina said was, so we're going to follow up with everybody, all the uh, registrants for today's webinar um, with a link to the slides and recording, as well as a link to our webinar feedback survey. And we'd really appreciate your feedback on today's uh, webinar, as well as topics that you'd like to see covered on a future webinar. And with that, I'm not seeing um, any other questions. So um, I. Um, yeah, so we will, uh, so have a great afternoon, everybody, and um, look forward for to an email in the next couple of weeks about our next plan webinar 
um, which will be on Thursday, September 19th. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon, everybody.